Hi, my name is Adam Max, and welcome to Nostalgia Obscura. I grew up on Flash games. They were a huge part of my childhood. When I was bored of doing homework and looking for some quick entertainment, I'd open up a game site on my computer and waste a few minutes. Admittedly, sometimes those minutes became hours, but for the most part, playing one Flash game didn't take too long. Compared to playing something on console or PC, it was quick, easy to set up, and easy to hide in case my mom came to check up on me and make sure I was doing my work. So, I ended up becoming intimately acquainted with several games that I otherwise never would have discovered if not for this habit of mine, and I want to talk about one of them today. I'm pretty sure everybody my age at the time had a single website or maybe a handful of sites as their go-to, where they would play the majority of their Flash games. Armor games, Newgrounds, Congregate, Miniclip, cool math games if you were playing on a filter. Your options were anything but limited. My primary site was a large repository called Ancon Arcade, which republished games of various types from other sites. If you're looking for a Flash game variety show, Ancon is the place to go. They used to do weekly updates and add new games to their catalog, but those updates seemed to have ended years ago when the format's popularity began dying out. I'd spend most of my time here, in the platform section. I was a big Mario fan as a kid, so naturally this category was the most immediately appealing to me. I ended up playing some fantastic and well-made games, along with some that weren't so good. But there was one that stood out strongly among the rest, one that was so unique and memorable that I still return to it to this day. And that game was Coma, by Thomas Brush. I was grabbed by this game as soon as it started. The art style, the sound design, the characters, the world it takes place in, all of it was so weird, but I loved it. It took me about 30 seconds to realize that I was playing something quite special. You play as a boy named Pete on a quest to rescue his sister from his dad's basement where he has her trapped, or at least that's the premise given by your bird companion. It plays like a fairly standard metroidvania, where you are free to explore the world around you, unlock new abilities as you go, and backtrack to previously inaccessible areas when those abilities are gained. Notably, there's no combat whatsoever in the game, nor the presence of hazards or enemies of any kind. It's just a lot of exploration and platforming with some minor puzzles. Scattered around the map are various Chekhov's guns that subtly inform you of what you're supposed to do with certain abilities. The game never out and out tells you. Naturally, the experience is fairly short. If you know what you're doing, then this game can be beaten within, say, 15 minutes. The artistic aesthetic of Coma is undoubtedly the first thing that will jump out at you. For a Flash game, it looks really distinct. The art is consistently beautiful and surreal, and evokes the feeling of having a dream as a child. Every speaking character simply appears as a blob-like black silhouette. Little details make the world feel alive, from the wisps floating in the fields, to birds flying in the sky, to hanging cloths and flowers blowing in the wind. The area where you are likely to spend the most time in, Redwind Fields, has lots of reds and oranges against a gray sky, creating a grouping of fall colors. Just like a real childhood dream, this world also has a dark side, with areas like the mansion, the silver chute, and Chill Bend having a more monochrome look to contrast with the palette of the fields. Animations are generally pretty simple. They get the job done, but aren't the main focus of the art. The game's writing is kind of ridiculous, but in a good way. All the characters give off an air of eccentricity in their dialogue that adds to the game's dreamlike quality. They're also all quite humorously immature, which is something I soon learned was practically a hallmark of Thomas Brush's writing. Some notable examples of this include Pete's dad threatening to kill him if he doesn't do a task, Gumboisa getting angry if Pete looks at him, Fat Simeon saying he has hypoinflammatory disorder, and Pete and his dad both calling Fat Simeon fatty fat cakes and fatty pancakes. It's all delightfully childish. The writing also has frequent misspellings, but I've got a feeling that a good number of those are actually intentional. Sound design for this game is pretty interesting. While Brush has credited the Free Sound project for some of his effects, he's also credited his own mouth. The more out there, unique sounds are likely the ones done by Brush. A short and distinct sound effect plays every time a character has dialogue, which actually very effectively introduces them and their personality, even without any voice acting. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. It kind of reminds me of character introductions in 3D Legend of Zelda games. Whoa. For the areas without music, by which I mean the dark areas, there are lots of ambient sounds that do a good job of making them feel pretty creepy.
Music in this game is fairly limited, but very appropriate for the setting. Despite being a looping track that lasts a minute and a half, the acoustic-driven theme of Redwind Field still sticks in the back of my mind. The layers of fingerpicking that slowly build on each other, coupled with the mysterious humming behind it, do wonders for establishing the game's atmosphere. There's a stripped version of this theme just before you enter the field that's simpler and even more tranquil, just strumming the chords against the sound effects of wind blowing and water rushing. A final theme plays during the credits, appropriately sounding equal parts victorious and surreal. This game left an incredibly strong impact on me, and I cannot recommend it enough. It's a testament to the value of memorable creations that I've still remembered something this small to this day, to the point at which I felt compelled to do a video on it. Thomas Brush more or less appears to have done this project entirely on his own, and I applaud him for his fantastic efforts. As an aspiring game developer myself, this kind of experience is one that I would like to make someday. Rush and his indie company Atmos Games are still around, by the way. After releasing Coma in 2010, he released Skinny in 2011, a Flash-based platformer about a robot unwittingly helping its master carry out her sinister intentions. It was decent, but it didn't leave nearly as much of a significant impact on me as Coma. This was around the time that Flash games' popularity was decreasing, and the standalone indie game was becoming a more common sight. Atmos games went quiet for a while, and I assumed the company had been left behind with the Flash format. So imagine my surprise in 2017 when I saw a review for an indie game called Pinstripe, a Metroidvania about a minister rescuing his daughter and escaping hell, and found the writing and artistic style to be incredibly familiar. Atmos games had finally made their debut on consoles and Steam with a new Metroidvania platformer. I bought and played it, of course, and it was a pretty nice short experience for the price I paid, carrying the signature style of an Atmos game with it, all the way down to the immature dialogue and dark imagery. I was pleased with the company's output and looked forward to what was coming next. That's when I saw the trailer for Once Upon a Coma. I couldn't believe it. The Flash game was getting a sequel in full game form. At the time of viewing, when the Kickstarter for the project was still collecting money, there was a demo available, so I of course downloaded and played it. And from what little I've seen, I'm optimistic. It definitely feels like an appropriate follow-up to the original game, with the same charm and wit, now upgraded to fit a new modern setting. Pete awakens from his coma to find that all the grown-ups in his town have gone missing, and that his sister Lily has gone off looking for them. There are a lot of returning characters in new forms, like John, Gumboisa, Fatty, and Bird. Pete now has a razor that he can use to attack enemies and break things, and it looks like certain areas of this game would serve as parallels to those in the Flash game, such as Pete's house, Reddington Field, and the Chilean Wood. I cannot tell you how happy I was to hear a new version of the Redwind theme, now focused around a piano instead of a guitar. The demo was short, as demos go, and ended once you popped Fatty, but I was more than willing to wait for this game's release. The Kickstarter ended in March of 2018, and the game was slated for release in September of that same year. Which didn't happen. It was delayed. Information on the game's progress was at a standstill for a while, until eventually its Steam page was updated with an all-new trailer and screenshots, revealing some changes had been made to the game. His name was Pete. His world was gray, until he found a friend one day. These include the addition of voice acting, the redesign of Pete, and some story alterations, like Pete now having to rescue his girlfriend instead of his sister. On that same trailer, which came out in summer of 2019, the release date was set to be Halloween of the same year. And it was delayed again. Most recently, an update was released by the studio stating that the game's name had actually been changed from Once Upon a Coma to Never Song. Although the game was ostensibly complete, marketing was cited as a significant reason for the alteration. As of the publishing of this video, the game has still not been released, nor has a release date been given. 
I'm not really worried about the stay of this project, though. Atmos has been pretty transparent about the game on social media, and if it takes some more time to create a masterpiece, then I'm happy to wait as long as necessary for the game to come out. In the meantime, I'll look at some of Thomas Brush's videos on YouTube. He makes some very well-produced content aimed towards up-and-coming indie game developers, making technical tutorials for Unity, as well as giving general advice about more surface-level things, like how to start your first project. Brush is very open about his experiences and his past mistakes, which is something I appreciate greatly as someone who is still learning the ropes. They make me feel a little less alone in my experience, and I sincerely hope that they help other aspiring developers as well. I'll keep one eye on Neversong, and hum the Redwind theme while I wait.